Hello, everybody in our Pacific Opera Victoria online audience, and welcome to Inside Opera. We have a very special little program for you today. We're going to talk a little bit about two wonderful operas that you can watch online by Lee Hoiby. A little bit more about them in a minute. And we're going to introduce you to somebody who has been working for the company now for quite a long time. Um, she was the repetiteur for the Pacific Opera production of Fidelio, and then came on board officially as our new uh, head coach and repetitor in the fall of 2020, which is, of course, as you know, when we were doing phantom productions rather than on stage productions. So it's going to be great to talk today with Kimberly Ann Bartzak, our, our guest. And um, we hope this will whet your appetite for hearing Kim play live with the singers. But there are some fantastic things you can see online. Uh, so Lee Hoiby uh, was a composer of distinction in a great many genres. He wrote some spectacular chamber music, a quintet for winds and strings, for, or a sextet for winds and strings, for example, and the violin sonata, uh, and also some orchestral pieces. But probably during his life, as well as now, when he's been dead for about eight or nine years, he was most celebrated for his vocal works, his songs, and his operas. The operas range from large-scale ones from his setting of Tennessee Williams' Summer and Smoke, back in the 70s to his, uh, I believe the last opera he wrote was a setting of Romeo and Juliet in 2004. Uh, and the songs were championed by any number of first-rate singers, including Leontine Price, who always had a Hoiby song on her recital programs. Uh, and his idiom is somewhat lyrical and melodious. Uh, I, I don't, I never know whether to say melodic or melodious, but it's full of melody. It responds, I think, extremely, uh, intuitively to the subtext and the text. And of course, obviously he wrote really well for singers and singing actors. Uh, and we had a wonderful time in 2004 producing his very, very beautiful setting of Shakespeare's Tempest. We had a great cast, great production team. Uh, but um, Lee came up to see it with his partner, Mark Schulgasser, who was also his librettist. And uh, during that time, we were doing Inside Opera live in the theater, as most of you will remember. And I can tell you, it's pretty nerve wracking to sit there and talk about an opera when its composer is four feet away from you sitting in the front row. He was, couldn't have been more gracious and he accepted my invitation to, uh, to address the audience himself. Lovely gentleman. And he really loved our production of The Tempest. And I'm pretty sure he'd like the two things that you can watch to anytime you want to um, online. Now, the pieces were both written for somebody who will be familiar to all of you, Edith Bunker, otherwise known in her professional life and personal life as Jean Stapleton. Uh, now, anybody who remembers all in the family will remember that um, Jean Stapleton's performance of the song that began each episode of All in the Family was not going to uh, instill in anybody a desire to hear her sing any further than that. But of course, she was singing in character as Edith. In fact, Jean Stapleton appeared in many musicals, including Bells Are Ringing with the legendary Judy Holliday. And so her voice is sort of somewhere, as she said, it's a one leg in, uh, in classical opera and art song and one leg in the music theater. Uh, and both of the pieces are designed to be one woman shows. Uh, there is a setting of a piece called The Italian Lesson by the legendary Ruth Draper. And you can still go online and hear Ruth Draper deliver it as a one woman monologue. This was a very, very specific type of career that she had, a very specific type of performer, a writer, uh, monologist, one woman actress. And she herself, Ruth Draper, excited the uh, admiration of performers as disparate as uh, Lily Tomlin and Catherine Hepburn, Laurence Olivier, and Joyce Grenfell. She had a huge following. And for somebody as intently uh, focused on the relationship between music and text. It's no surprise at all that she appealed to Lee Hoiby and Mark Schulgasser. Uh, so really, um, the, one of the pieces, the larger of the two, is a setting of this fantastic comedy about a Manhattan matron who is uh, going through the motions of learning Italian with a special emphasis on Dante, a writer she's unlikely ever to understand. Um, and she keeps getting um, uh, in, interrupted by the minutiae and vicissitudes of everyday life, uh, including a young child being stuck in a wastebasket and an unexpected visit from her lover. Uh, the other piece is derived from 
um, <clears throat> a one woman television star named Julia Child, who I'm sure most of you will remember as well. And if you watch Julia Child, or if you ever saw the film in which Meryl Streep played Julia Child, you'll know that she pretty much sang anyway while she was talking in the, in the, in the kitchen. There were these sort of pitched and vibrato laden um, utterances as she talked about roasting lamb, or in this case, making a chocolate cake. And in this case, again, we have Mark Chilgasser kind of shepherding the words of Julia Child into this one woman extravaganza called the Bon Appetit. I'll just say that the works are for a, rel are for a relatively small, I would say, chamber orchestra. And so you will hear when you go online, you will hear an orchestra, you will hear Kim Bartzak playing herself because I mean, most chamber orchestras will find the piano as an indispensable member. Uh, it's true that Lee Hoibe sometimes accompanied them himself on only piano. So I think he's probably would be okay with that. Um, but without saying anything further myself, it's a great pleasure to introduce you to uh, Kimberly Ann Bartzak, Kim, our new, uh, principal coach and repetitor who was on this project every step of the way. Kim, welcome. I'd love to hear your thoughts about working on the Hoibies and about being part of our POV musical staff. Yes, thank you so much, Robert, for even inviting me uh, to be part of this um, living opera chat. It's uh, It's been a wonderful nine months with the company. And um, I will say, you know, just diving very quickly into this opera, uh, and I don't know if you know this, but Lee Hoibe was actually a concert pianist. So a lot of his piece, um, a lot of his writing, specifically in these two operas, um, are quite prolific. You know, it's a lot of filigree fingerings. And there's um, on SoundCloud, which I'm not sure if people still use to this day, there's a recording of Lee Hoibe playing and Mark Schulgasser um, doing the Italian lesson. And it's, it's quite fascinating actually, because Mark is by no means a singer, but his approach to the piece was very musical theater-esque. You know, it's kind of coming in and out of singing, um, speech-like pattern, very, very much like um, how Megan Latham uh, interpreted. Because in the score, there's, um, Lee Hoibe was very precise on where he wanted it spoken, um, where he wanted it so much to be, um, you know, kind of in the middle of the pitch, or where he wanted speech pattern or recit or sung. So he was very specific. But then when we listened to this recording, it kind of just, you know, threw out the whole idea of thinking of this as an opera and more as a musical theater piece, really, really kind of channeling Ruth Draper and how she would have interpreted it as much as possible. So it was quite fascinating, um, you know, not really, I guess, you know, something that's everybody does all the time in opera is we try to keep the score, you know, to be as close as possible to how the composer wanted the piece, how the composer wrote it and his specific ideas. But in this case, I think we kind of just really went more of a musical monologue approach and just interpreted it how, you know, kind of really just channeling Ruth Draper as much as possible, which is quite fascinating. The, um, in, um, Bon Appetit. The, the other thing that I found really great was Megan really took to heart Julia Child's idioms, you know, kind of just being very vocal in the kitchen. Um, you know, there's one pot, uh, one spot where she drops the pot and she kind of gets all flustered. And again, Lee Hoibe really puts into, um, he puts into perspective, he, he really makes the music come alive within those moments. The um, one spot that I absolutely love, but I practiced way too many times because, you know, it's it's very much a contra, not, not a contrapuntal, but it's a six against four uh, section in the piano part um, where the, um, she's mixed, she, she has her competition with mixing bowl and the mixing bowl is put on the highest speed possible. So here she is, you know, just kind of getting at, um, getting at the mixing as much as, uh, as quickly as possible. And you just hear the in the piano part throughout the whole time. So it's, it's really just, you, you hear the, the juxtaposition of the two tempos and, you know, who's gonna win? Is, is it the right hand of the piano that's doing the six tuplets? which is the mixing bowl, is it the left hand with, you know, the 16th notes, which is her mixing it live. So it's, you can really see how Lee Hoibe really 
saw the music and how he interpreted it and did such great justice to to the score to to Julia Child and to Ruth Draper. That's awesome. Now you've you've been a part of the online POV season, the first ever one. Um, so you've worked with our uh, people who are very close to the POV experience, for instance, both conductors Timothy and Joey, and you've worked with Glynis quite a lot now. And of course, you've worked with our one woman uh, wunder person, uh, Megan Latham, before. That's so correct. How, how have you enjoyed this? Oh, I absolutely loved it. Um, you know, within the artistic community in Canada, everybody says that Pacific Opera Victoria is the company that they love working for, that they love, they love the team, they love the city, obviously, um, and you really feel very much like a team. There's no, you know, there's no hierarchy in the rehearsal space, um, in the office. It's really, we really do the best that we can to make the production go as smoothly as possible. Um, you know, I absolutely love Timothy Vernon. I feel everything that comes out of his out mouth, especially when it comes to music, mm. are these little gems of knowledge. and. You know, a few times I've tried over the year to kind of stump him with, you know, little fun facts that I've read online. And, you know, without a fault, he'll always be like, oh yeah, I know that person. And then he'll kind of just give me this brief history on yes. <laughs> the composer. And and it's always so fascinating because he has, you know, he's he is a walking encyclopedia. And you would think that with all this knowledge, with all this experience, that, you know, you there would be some form of intimidation and it's it's not it's the complete opposite he he really you know embraces everyone in that room he takes the time to go and say hello to everybody when we were in our orchestra rehearsals for uh, a, a show that we were doing in november called the garden of Ballas, mm -hmm. you know he took the time and went and said hello to every single orchestra member whom he hadn't seen in over eight nine months right because mm -hmm because of the pandemic. And you don't, you don't see that very often. You don't see someone taking the time to say, to even to just say hello and, you know, start up a very short conversation. Glynis is the exact same way. You know, she's, she's a fireball, which is so impressive. And, you know, again, so much knowledge. She, um, we tried very, very hard in the, uh, in Bon Appetit um, to even just find, the original show of a uh, Julia Child show of making this chocolate cake. And we found the recipe, which was great, but we could not find um, the original video. And, and Glynis looked everywhere, you know, she contacted BBC, she contacted the archives and they've even sent her, I think it was volume one and volume two of the Julia Child um, shows. And yet this specific episode wasn't online. You, you know, there's, I think it's Des Moines Opera has um, a trailer when they made this, uh, made when they did Bon Appetit, my apologies. And they, you know, you see some snippets and I, and I, you know, did some research and those snippets are actually from a different show, but, you know, still kind of gives at least that, that eminence of it being, um, you know, being from the same era and same cooking show. But I think up until like the day before we were wrapping up the show, Glynis was still looking for the original recording. And, you know, and I find that so fascinating being someone, you know, from, you know, a younger generation seeing so much passion and, you, you know, they really just put in all of their efforts and all of their energy into the show that they're in. And then just, you know, it's quite inspiring, right? Like it's something that I would love to strive, I strive to become. Yeah, I feel the same way. I, I first worked with Timothy and Glynis together in 1981, 40, for, in the summer of 1981 for abduction from the Seraglio. Glynis had just begun her opera direction career the year before with Barbara Seville. It was fantastic working with both of them, and it still is. And, you know, what we, what we are told so often is that in a field like music, a field like theater, a field like opera, you, we're always students. There's always more to learn. But you're right. You don't often find people at that level of accomplishment who still really embody that idea. So it's inspiring indeed. Um, and I'll just pass this in as well for the people who will go online and see this. It has also um, the contributions of somebody who has been a very close collaborator with Glynis for many years, Pam Johnson, fantastic designer. And she creates for these pieces as well as Garden of Alice, this complete world. 
uh, it complements everything that's happening musically and um, and dramatically. Now, Kim, I want to just mention to everybody who may not know this, uh, but you have you have trained and um, and worked a lot as a coach, a repetitor, and also a conductor. And you've had experience in Vancouver and other young artist programs and uh, companies. And did you also work out east in opera at uh, Opera in the Avalon? Yeah, I so I kind of slowly keep making my way to the west coast and I think this is the farthest that I can go. <laughs> um, but I, I did I worked at Opera in the Avalon for about six, I want to say six summers. I started off as uh, a repetitor and then I um, I think the next year I became the assistant conductor mm -hmm. to Judith Yon and they took a chance on me and then they gave me the school tour where I was the music director and conductor. So I, you know, I've done um, Enfant des Sortilages as one. I even got the chance to conduct a full production of Sound of Music at Opera in the Avalon, which was, you know, a wonderful experience. Um, you know, just a, a fun little anecdote. For Sound of Music, Judith Yon was the one who, conducting it and I was playing the piano in the pit. And she had, I wanna say maybe, two weeks before we were opening, she contacted me and said, hey, you know, do you wanna conduct the matinee? And I said, oh my gosh, of course, like I'd love to, but who's gonna take my place in the pit? And her response was, well, I will. So we, we literally swapped roles in that production. And it was kind of interesting because I, I got to see her in the pit the whole time, right? You know, just really beaming with, you know, joy and, and proudness to kind of, because she gave me this opportunity. So I, you know, I, I, I'm fully, I'm always in debt to Opera on the Avalon because they've given me so many opportunities. And I think because of that, um, I, yeah, so I was in the Young Arts Program, the Emerging Arts Program at Vancouver Opera. And I was the resident conductor at, and repetitor at Calgary Opera for three years before coming to POV. Uh, and in Calgary, I got to also conduct uh, a really interesting show called, um, Ghost Opera. Sorry, I had a. <laughs> uh, it was written by yeah. It was written by Veronica Krausis, a Canadian composer who now lives in LA, and it was it was quite an interesting project because it was actually um, the old Trout Puppet uh, Workshop, who was a fascinating company. They've done Hansel and Gretel and Vancouver Opera. They're known for their massive, massive puppets. And we did this co-production with them and it was just so fascinating. We got to do a sold, we sold out in Banff and then did, I think it was nine performances uh, in Calgary, all sold out because it was, again, it was a really interesting hybrid of opera fans and old trout puppet fans. So, and then, you know, obviously fans of Veronica Cressus. So it just kind of embellished all of those three worlds into one magical moment. That's, Kim, that's awesome. I'm not going to ask you this. I, I didn't know about your affiliation with Old Trout. Did you get to know Peter Balkwell? I did, yeah. Isn't he, isn't he a fantastic guy? He He's amazing. Really? Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love all of them. And I, yeah. and I believe Judd, oh, his last name is escaping me, uh, he lives in Victoria. So they, you know, there's uh, Peter Balkwell. There's also... Um, and I want to say that they're all in Calgary. Their their main workshop is there. There, um, but they're such fascinating people. And and I, I want to say three weeks before we you know we even got together in the rehearsal space, they invited everybody um, to go to their shop and just kind of you know hang out and get to get to know each other a little bit better. And that's something you know I that's something that I absolutely love with projects like this because then you end up getting to know the person behind the mm -hmm. art and it makes you enjoy the art that much more because you end up you know more often than not you end up finding a similar connection and you know just by being in the same space and just kind of communicating and realizing that you're all doing it for the the greater good which is it's, probably the worst line to say but it's true it's true it's true and also it's it's i mean i worked with pete back in the 90s and we still are you know we're still friends and stuff um wow. so I'm, I'm glad that that company's done so well and uh it's sort of like what we've i think managed to forge during these difficult and challenging months of the pandemic um the project you mentioned earlier garden of alice by elizabeth Fromm, and then these pieces by lee hoiby and then the uh the benjamin britton projects um, these these haven't been uh, they haven't been easy listening projects. They're extremely challenging, 
Uh, and uh, I feel very uh, encouraged that audience re response has been so good. So I'm going to just ask you this, um, speaking of, you know, bringing little bits of minutia to the conversation. Did you realize that Lee Hoiby was a huge, huge fan of Joni Mitchell? Really? Oh, I yes. didn't know that. Yes. Um, he said that he was he was given an opportunity to meet her once, but he, did, he didn't want to just in case meeting her in person uh, sort of disappointed him or... Um, <gasps> She didn't live up to his his idol uh, anyway. I thought that was great because I'm a big fan of Joni Mitchell's as well. Um, and speaking of sensitivity to words. Uh, so I'm just going to just say thank you very much, Kim, for being part of this Inside Opera. And also just to remind everybody, uh, the two the two pieces by Lee Hoiby are um, up and available online until June 21st. You, you see these the great performances um, by the Victoria Symphony with Kim Bartek at the piano, led by Giuseppe Pietro Roya. And, uh, uh, directed by Glynis Lation, uh, designed by Pam Johnson, and of course, with the incomparable Megan Latham playing these uh, wonderful roles. Uh, Megan is able to step into the slightly over the top qualities of these characters absolutely as easily as Meryl Streep herself. Um, so I hope you all enjoy it. Thanks a lot for being here. Thanks for listening to us and uh, great. This is the longest conversation we've had since you arrived in Victoria. So I'm looking forward to having one more informal with a wine on the table. How's that? Likewise, that sounds wonderful. Okay, thanks again, Kim, and uh, we'll see you soon, everybody. Bye for now. Bye.